Hi, time for some thoughts on Kindred by Octavia Butler, which used to be quite an obscure book, but these days is really famous and it sells really, really well, I'm pleased to say, because I recall when it was first published back in the UK way back in 1987. All right, let's have a look. This is the Women's Press edition from, let's see, 1988. And this is the first UK edition. There was no hardcover. It was published in the States, I think in 1980, is copyrighted 79. So there was an eight year time lag and I say come at Women's Press and this is the UK first edition, which I've recently gone back to so I can talk about this um, book because its context has changed quite a lot. Um, Butler had been published previously in the UK in hardcover. Sidgwick did a hardcover of Wild Seed, which is really beautiful, incredibly collectible. I'd love to have one. And also in paperback, I think she was published in the paperback by Futura Orbit, maybe. And I have read some of the works which were published in that publisher in a format. And of course, Octavia Butler was black. Now, really, that shouldn't matter. And if you cast your mind back and think about the way books were, and the books still generally are, when you picked up a science fiction novel, you had no way really of knowing what the author's ethnicity was, except to go by their name and of course often they were pseudonymous and usually yes they were white men <laughs> some of them were middle class and they were women and often if anything it was women whose names were disguised arguably for commercial reasons to stop putting the predominantly male SF readership off buying them for decades I mean look at C.L. Moore, Catherine Lucille Moore, look at Lee Brackett, Lee being a ambiguous name, though of course Lee for a man is normally spelled L-E-E. -E. It might have been different then back in the 1940s. Look at C.J. Cherry. She didn't call herself Caroline Cherry, but of course there were people like Zena Henderson in the late 50s, early 60s, Catherine McLean, Judith Merrill um, in the 50s. They never made any bones about their identity in terms of gender and what have you. But you know, it was sometimes difficult to pick out somebody's race or ethnicity. But it really wasn't on the table then, for rather like Martin Luther King said, he didn't want his children judged by the colour of their skin, but by their character. And I think with books, you shouldn't judge them by any of those sort of factors, even though if there's something polemical or something that needs to be said, then obviously it's good to know those things. Those are usually non-fiction things. And really, you know, you should have judged by what Oscar Wilde said, you know, there's no such thing as a good or bad book morally. There's only a well-written book or a badly written book. And of course that opens up whole new questions of subjectivity about what makes for good reading. So this appeared in Women's Press. And as I've said in other videos, what my recollections are of selling Women's Press SF back in the 80s was that they were predominantly bought when they were bought at all, because it wasn't a really popular series. It was popular enough to produce quite a few titles and it kept going for quite some time. So they were obviously selling, but I think they were primarily being bought by men. That was certainly my experience selling them. It might have been different in different bookshops, different cities, and obviously some women would have bought them. But it was great because these are things often you'd heard about that you couldn't actually get to read. And they appeared, they did, you know, they did all sorts of things, all sorts of SF. They did people like Doris Bersertia, Star Rider, who's very strange, Joan Sloan Suzuki, um, Door Into Ocean, which is like a Lagan type thing, and you know, Octavia Butler and ma many others who I really like. Suzette Hayden Elgin, Joanna Russ, people I really like reading. So there were all sorts of things in the imprint, but they weren't particularly successful. So she wasn't a commercial success in the mass market A format paperbacks that were produced of her work in the late 70s, early 80s, because if they had been, then this would have been jumped on by the publishers. Because contrary to popular belief, most publishers don't really care who you are, what you are, where you come from, where you're going. All they care about is, can you produce books that sell? So, you know, had her work really taken off,
it would have stayed in print and what have you. And because there was no real indication on the books themselves that she was a woman of colour, she's obviously a woman because Octavia is a female name. I know that's probably not the right sort of thing you would say these days, but back in the late 70s, early 80s, you wouldn't get many people saying, you know, Octavia is a bloke's name as well. You know, Octavian, the <laughs> Roman emperor would have been, but Octavia was pretty unambiguous. Maybe that went, to get, went against her, but it would have gone against all female SF writers. And the fact is, apart from a dedicated small number of women who would read SF then, the majority of them not going there. And this came out, of course, the new British space opera Renaissance had started. Um, e and M Banks had produced Consider Phlebas in 1986, Paperback 87, Play of Games was run by that time as well. Colin Greenland had produced Take Back Plenty. And that won the BSFA award. And interestingly enough, Take Back Plenty has a female protagonist of colour and two sequels. So there you go. So it wasn't it was something that was in the air, it was something that was happening anyway. This idea that SF only started tackling gender and race and all these things in the last 10, 15 years, as I've said before, is absolute nonsense. It's old hat to SF. SF is always ahead of the social trends in those ways. The SF readership at that time in the UK was still adjusting to cyberpunk and they were getting used to writers like Greg Bear, Lucia Shepard and it was a really amazing time and the sort of new wave guys in Britain who'd been dominant for quite some time were becoming more and more accepted by the mainstream or at least grudgingly so and they were seeing their books published in liveries which weren't genre ones, people like Christopher Priest, J.G. Ballard, um, M. John Harrison, these were starting to appear in books which looked like mainstream novels rather than SF novels. So it was an interesting time and American writers particularly were really, really important. It was a very exciting time. And there is a video on the channel where I talk about the top 10 US male writers in sort of 80s SF. And I've been meaning to do some more in that series. I haven't got around to it. So Kindred, you know, as I say now, is massively famous and popular book and it's really grown in prominence in the last decade and it had a rather commercial cover put on it about 10 years ago which I'll flash up on the screen now. And when Kindred reappeared 10-15 years ago in paperback, I remember saying to the buyer where I worked and I was a buyer myself back then as well, you know, we need to get behind this. The, the, the time has come for this book. It's becoming more well known. These issues are more on the table. They're very fashionable. They've been discussed a lot. And I use the word fashionable for a particular reason. I'll come back to that in a moment. And, you know, again, I asked myself, where were all the yaysayers in the late 80s? A lot of the people who like this book now have read it weren't even born, obviously. But this is interesting because in the current edition, there's a introduction by a female writer of colour. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say a black writer, um, a black lady. And she talks about how somebody recommended Kindred to her. And she was not initially keen because she effectively writes, I'm paraphrasing her, that she didn't think a science fiction novel could provide the kind of inspiration that she was looking for. So there you go, an old prejudice against SF based on not reading the text, but looking at the representation of the lowest common denominator of science fiction, what you see on a screen. As I've said to you many times, way too many people judge SF by what they see on a screen as opposed to what's on a printed page. And very often what you'll see on a screen is the lowest common denominator. So to begin with, there's a real irony here, a book which is about racial prejudice. It's a book about slavery, a time travel story about slavery. And this book has been prejudiced against by a writer of colour without looking at the text purely because it belongs to a certain group of works. Now, isn't race a grouping of individuals? The failure to look at something as individual, as part of a group, from somebody who is a writer of colour, somebody in a minority, somebody who would be against prejudice and comes across that way in the introduction to the book, being prejudiced, that tells us one thing. This is from somebody who probably feels she's experienced group prejudice, she's experienced racial prejudice, is that prejudice is common to all cultures, all races, to all of humanity. And it's an interesting thing that something that people don't want to talk about very often in the whole new, brave, new, strange, difficult new world of identity politics is that very often 
these things which we can see as negative are often the common undercurrents of us all. As much as the good things that bind people together, there's also these things which we would deem to be morally bad that bind them together. And prejudice is one of them. So straight away, prejudice against SF. So there is a kind of irony there, which I find very entertaining. So I'll let you meditate on the irony while I talk about the book. And Kindred is um, it's very good. It's, it's really readable. It's an easy read. It's a quick read. It is quite gripping and compelling. And I would recommend it to, to most readers. You know, I really would say it's, it's very, very readable per se. It's not a difficult book in any way at all. And it's about a young black woman called Dana. And she's the point of view first person narrator in the book. And she lives in California in the late 70s. And she's doing sort of menial work. And she aspires to be a writer, rather like Butler was herself. And Butler, I think, published her first work, um, short stories in the early 70s. Now, she struggled quite a bit. She had some support, I think, financially and spiritually from Harlan Allison, who was a right on guy, you know, Harlan. Of course, Harlan was Jewish, so he understood prejudice, racial prejudice. And he was somebody who went on those civil rights marches in the early 60s. You know, he was he was somebody very active that way. So I know they had an interaction. And I think her first novels were published about 75. There's that initial trilogy. And this sort of pops up after she'd done about two in the initial trilogy, I think. So anyway, Dana in the story is um, finds herself falling into a relationship with another writer, with a white man um, called Kevin, who is just about becoming successful himself as a writer. And they've both gone through this thing where maybe their families have not been that keen on them, wanting to be writers and to sell them and get proper jobs. So, you know, that's something which a lot of people who write can relate to. The book itself opens with a jolting pair of very memorable, if boldly expressed sentences. And they don't immediately insert an SF novum, a new thing, or a paradigm shift that you get in, say, the opening lines of 1984, which, of course, the opening line of 1984 was, um, it was a bright cold day in April and the clocks are striking 13. And obviously that's nothing special now, but that tells you that in the world of 1984, as written in the late 40s, that that was unusual, the clock striking 13, very strange. And of course, in Christopher Priest's Inverted World, after that initial preamble, you get the wonderful sentence, I had reached the age of 650 miles. What you get in this, I'll just read it to you so I can give you the exact flavor. And it's from the prologue. I lost an arm on my last trip home, my left arm. So, you know, that's quite in your face. And as John Clute says, she's not frivolous. And as the narrative unfolds, what happens is that Donna finds herself mysteriously transported back in time. And initially it happens just for a few minutes and she is then transported back home and virtually no time has gone in between. And it's a common conceit when somebody does a time travel narrative maybe you're in the past for like three days and you come back and no time has elapsed there's no time machine in this there's no technology in this so you could argue this is actually fantasy rather than sf and i'm inclined to think that way but there's no suggestion of actual magic or the supernatural and what ties Donna to the past is definitely scientific because it's genetic so that's the important thing and it's genetic obviously to underline some of the ideas about race so she is transported back in the past and she saves a young boy from a dangerous situation and she gradually discovers that she is pulled back into the past whenever this young boy is in a dangerous situation and of course he gets into dangerous situations not every five minutes but years apart subjectively from his time and the time that he lives in is the south of um, the southern states during the time of slavery the early 19th century so obviously you're straight into an area where you could have strong polemical writing and what i like about this book is that she doesn't really rub your face in it you know she sort of covers all the important things that she needs to cover about slavery and oppression and that time in america but she doesn't or at least that part of america because there are free states and her historical research is really spot on because i think people don't know as much about these things as they think they should and i, I would be the first to say i don't i feel we should all know more about the actual historical detail because the devil is in the detail and you know she she just lays it out there and it's very good this partially comes across in the fact that her prose is quite bold and unadorned. It's not very sensory. 
there's no real sense of climate, of heat, smells, physical descriptions of the Mion scene are absent. And I guess maybe that's to do with my reading of writers from the Southern States and books set in the Southern States. If you take, for example, Anne Rice's interview with a vampire, and forget the current recent adaptation that's been on the TV, forget that if you go back to the book, then, you know, Rice obviously quite a romantic novelist with a large R. She makes quite a lot of the scents and smells of sort of Creole country of New Orleans and those things. And also George R. R. Martin does it in his um, marvellous rip-roaring tale, The Vampire One, what's it called? And Fever Dream, fantastic little book. Great storytelling, great fun. If you've not read Fever Dream by George R. R. Martin, really good. And that's set in the days of slavery, about two rival cadres of vampires battling over a Mississippi steamboat and there are plantation scenes and there's a really horrible white overseer on this one plantation called Sour Billy who's disgusting and you know it's rip roaring tales so there's none of that so she sort of strips up that romantic element that would be in something like Margaret Mitchell's Gone with the Wind and she she gets more down to the sort of gritty core of it she tends to tell rather than show in that respect and she info dumps where she has to through dialogue which is absolutely fine because there isn't a lot of info for dump because what's really not explained is how these time slips and time shifts are happening. And that's okay, because that really isn't important. This isn't an engineering book. She tells a story, but it's not stylistically engaging. Um, and that fits in with the simple, direct SF storytelling of today. So in a way, you could argue this is a book ahead of its time. And I found when I read earlier works by her, that the prose was straight ahead, but in some parts, strangely cluttered and clunky and it would trip me over and I didn't really get on it and I didn't even though it had a nice astringent quality I didn't find that the work was that enjoyable to read and I felt that she needed a bit more style but her approach works for this even though I personally would have preferred it to have had a little bit more colour and to have brought things to life a bit more and I think that would have under underlined her messages with a bit more strength. What Dana discovers when she's suddenly tripped back in time to the days of slavery is that she has fallen in with a family called the Waylands, and they're a white family and they have various slaves, all from a black of course, and the young boy that she has called back through time to help is white. He has red hair, he has auburn hair. And it's an interesting thing, you know, there is such a, there is this thing about bias against people with auburn hair, which I just don't understand. I found that really weird. So maybe there was a point being made there and it's relatively unusual if there's smaller number of people have auburn hair, the blonde or dark or what have you. So maybe there's a kind of kindred thing there. And what she discovers is that the boy is actually one of her ancestors. So she has some white blood, as many, many people descended from slaves in the USA or the Caribbean have. You know, there was that sort of abuse and sometimes of course there was proper interaction and as I say Dana's husband Kevin is white and there's one point where he too is transported back in time with her and he sort of poses as the idea that they are, are not quite married but they're together and they come from New York they come from a free state rather than the southern state. One of the most interesting things in the book, and you could sort of argue that it's difficult to suspend disbelief, but I didn't find it so, is that the Waylands accept Dana because they've seen her suddenly flash into existence and then she disappears for years and then she's back subjectively to her sometimes only a few minutes, hours or days later, but to them it's years and years and years. And her sudden appearances, which she gradually explains to the members of the family and to the slaves in their menage, that she is from the future and they sort of are incredulous to this but they do seem to have some sort of common sense which perhaps she inherits uh, through her connection to them and she realizes that unless a certain things thing happens with young Waylon that she will never exist so there is a kind of interesting thing there where she's watching for this event to occur it's a good novel it's a very charged subject as I say, it doesn't rub things in your face too much, but you do feel for Donna and you, you experience these horrible moments where, where people are treated really badly. But it isn't a full-blown polemic, it is an entertainment. And that opening sentence about her losing her arm, that loops back through and comes up later in the book. And I found that really interesting. That's probably the most sort of sf moment of it. And that's the one thing about the book that makes it linger in my mind whenever I think about it. Before I talk about Kindred a bit more, I just wanted to talk a bit more about 
um, black SF writers and the perception that they've never been there or that they were in a minority or what have you. And of course they have been in a minority because science fiction in the Anglophone world has largely been in the USA and America and in the UK at least the actual percentage of people of colour, particularly people of Afro-Caribbean, Sub-Saharan Af African living in the UK, until very recently it's been absolutely tiny and it's only 4% now. You wouldn't think this by looking in the media, you see a lot of TV programmes, dramas, films, um, advertisements and they're full of black people but actually Britain is relatively empty of black people is the reality of this. And if you sort of think that there weren't any black SF writers before Delaney, for example. I mean, here's an example. Here's a book I bought a while ago. I've not read it yet. Looks really interesting. And this is George S. Shulia's Black Empire, which, as you can see, is a Penguin classic. And George Shulia has been famous or for years and years and years for a book called Black No More, in which it just, I think came in the 30s. And it's about a black guy in racist America in that time who undergoes this cure and becomes white. So, you know, obviously that's pretty direct and in your face. And this sounds really interesting. This was a serial in a newspaper and the amazing serial story of a black genius against the world, publication from 1936 to 1938, the Pittsburgh Courier. And it's about a black African scientific genius. There's a black female aviatrix in it. And they are gonna take the African continent, the dark continent, back from imperialist rule. And it just sounds like rip-roaring. You know, it sounds really interesting. It's like fun. So this is a pioneering work of what you call Afrofuturism, if you want to call that. I'm not so sure that Afrofuturism is a thing myself. And I'm going to talk about that in the introduction to another book I have here. But of course, what I would say is if there is a founding text of Afrofuturism, it's arguably Mafaka the Futurist by Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. And I talk about the Italian. Um, and I talk about Marinetti, who is a poet, military figure, futurist, avant-garde artist, in my video about H.G. Wells' story, A Dream of Armageddon. I'll stick a link in at the end of the video, because not many people have watched it. It's quite interesting. So there's that. So that's one example. And here's another one from the MIT Radium Age series. And this is Of One Blood by Pauline Hopkins. And interestingly, this the Radium Age has been around for a few years and they've done these great books, these great covers by Seth. And they're not proto-SF. They're SF between around about the turn of the century and some of them into the 30s. So they're mostly in that period where science fiction was called scientific romance rather than science fiction. So it wasn't called science fiction until 1925, 1926. And the thing that does annoy me about these books is that they have a series forward and it does have the narrative and it. it does say, oh, you know, there's all these voices, there are people of colour, there are women and they've been ignored. So it's just absolute nonsense. So they are trying a bit too hard on the virtue signalling. Now, virtue, sig virtue signalling is a triggering phase for many people. So let's talk about that. I find triggering to trigger me because I just think that you can't have any sort of debate in society anymore without people suddenly sort of losing it over one word where they haven't thought about the detail and nuance and how important it is to use words for us to discuss ideas and concepts objectively. And what I see as virtue signaling is if you think about social media, this sort of social media, any sort, is that, you know, people generally want to be thought of well. People naturally want to be admired and thought of as good people. You know, hardly anybody wants to be thought of as just a badass. You know, most people want to be thought of as, as if they're good. So part of the problem with that is that people then think about how to best present themselves, how to market themselves through the world of social media. And we all do it and we shouldn't do it. We shouldn't censor ourselves. We shouldn't, we should really be honest and direct. And as Martin Luther King said, you know, really sort of put it across in our actions rather than our identities. And so I see it all as a form of marketing and I see it as quite cynical. So this series has rather irritated me, even though it's dug up interesting things, some of which I wasn't aware of and some I'd actually read many years ago. It is slightly irritating because it is pushing that diversity envelope. And that's OK. That's absolutely fine. But it's trying too hard. And 
never mind about that is this good science science fiction the important thing is of course this is a historical series so say look this is what was going on in this period not just Edgar Rice Burroughs and A. Merritt okay which is absolutely fine but interestingly this is of one blood Pauline Hopkins and there's an introduction in here by let's see there's the series introduction and then there's a introduction by somebody called Minister Faust I've no idea who they are and he says the term Afrofuturism is wrong. I don't use that word to describe my own novels or anything in the field of Afrocentric science fiction and fantasy, because self because self definition is the prerequisite for self determination. Why should any African employ non African coinages for global African cultural production? Well, first of all, I would say if it's global, then it's perfectly okay to use something which isn't specifically African because otherwise you're just going to restrict it to African but you know it's absolutely fine and he says um, we make it so we need to name it again that's fair enough but there is already a discourse of terminology in science fiction which has been used and studied by writers readers critics academics and prominent amongst these people is Samuel R. Delaney who has probably written more about science fiction and language than anybody in the history of the genre and of course Delaney is black and he's bisexual and he's a linguist so you know already and yes okay he's the exception that proves the rule but the point is he's done important work and it's there and it's influential work and his own books are fantastic examples of SF and fantasy and have been regarded as such since the 1960s not that it was a problem for him so Minister Faust goes on to say what else does he say Second, the discarded term Afrofuturism, and I'm quite happy for it to be discard discarded because I don't think it's a thing, as I say, includes the term futurism, suggestive of the Italian art movement whose leader is the author of the Futurist Manifesto and the Fascist Manifesto. So there you go. So I say check out that video. So it is quite interesting. And if you want to look into the links between SF and futurism, one revisionist and recursive way of looking at that is look at Bruce Sterling's recent books because Bruce lives in Italy and has done a couple of books which are set in Italy and which are fantasienza stories. Fantasienza is what the Italians call SF. So there you go. This is an interesting one and let's see long before marvel comics gave us black panther and wakanda a high-tech african country that's never been colonized this 1903 novel so there you go and of course the black panther is an interesting one because black panther has been written a lot by a guy called christopher priest and that's not the christopher priest it's a guy who called himself christopher j priest and that wasn't his real name he just picked up and decided to use it and really you know that was a bit daft and that caused real problems for the original real christopher priest and CP's own belief, he said to me, and I think it's in the interview I did with him, was that the Christopher Priest, the comics writer, that he chose that name because Chris Priest, the original Chris Priest, he was being talked about in Hollywood at that time because the prestige had been sold and it was coming up. So there might be something to that. And it's worth remembering, of course, that if you look at Black Panther, Black Panther was created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, two Jewish guys, you know, so there you go. So there's a couple of examples of early Afrofuturist or discarded term Afrofuturist SF there to sort of look at. One thing about looking at Kindred again made me think of was existentialism. And it's a philosophy I've always been interested in for a very long time. I first read Sartre and Camus back in the mid 80s when I knew very little about existentialism. And I learned a lot about it through reading Colin Wilson who wanted to posit a new form of existentialism, which was less defeatist, called the new existentialism. And this isn't the time and place to go into that. But the interesting thing about existentialism, the basic idea of it is, is that for human beings as individuals, what happens is this, your existence precedes your essence. You exist first and your essence, your inner core, is something that comes later. And this is best summed up by a concept that Heidegger wrote about, and Heidegger was a pioneering existentialist. He wrote about the concept of thrownness, how we're thrown into the world, we're born and that's it. And you know, this is in, if you know the song Riders on the Storm by The Doors, and of course Jim Morrison and Ray Mantrick particularly were big readers. And in that the lyric goes, into this world we're thrown, 
like a dog without a bone, like an actor out on loan. And this is about existentialism. So we're thrown at the world and we have to try and make sense of it. it and so we exist first and our essence comes later. Now, what do we mean by essence? By essence, we mean identity and what we are. So obviously, one of the first things about this is that Dana is thrown or pulled, whatever you put it, she is thrown into this world of the past, the seven states of slavery. And she exists first. She has this life in the modern world and she's a writer and she has this relationship with another writer and then she's thrown into the past where she becomes defined by the social situation of slavery you know she really has to watch herself and it's very very dangerous and you know you can imagine how awful that must be to be oppressed so her very essence her very identity that she's built up through her own life and, and being free um, is mediated in a different way for the society around her. Now, of course, because she lives in 1970s California, you could say, you know, this obviously, is there still racism in America? Of course, there's racism all over the world. We know that. So the people who are in minorities will feel that. We're never going to deny that. We're not going to deny that that's the thing. It is there. So what Dan is doing in her struggle to become a writer is to define her own essence. And this is one of the key creators of existentialism that you are born free, intellectually free. Um, your essence, is there's nothing in your essence apart from your genes. And of course, this is interesting because race is a key sort of point in this book. And you, you, you make your own essence, you, you move through life. And do you accept what society puts upon you? Do you reject it? How much can you reject it when there's pressure from other people to get you to conform? And how much do you create your own essence? So you exist first through thrownness. You're in the world and then you have to build your own identity. And Sartre talked about a thing called bad faith, which was that if you accepted too much of what other people wanted you to do, say or think, and you were deluding yourself and you were suppressing your true self, your true individuality, the essence that you were developing through looking at the world, then that was bad faith and you would never be happy. So you were condemned to be free. And part of that freedom was that you were free to choose. You're free to choose your identity. So obviously there's a social thing there where society wants you to do a certain thing. And, you know, everybody can relate to this, I think. I mean, where I come from in South Wales, it was very, I found it very oppressive. I wanted to sort of be involved in the arts and creativity. And my culture was very much about, you know, the, the cliched things you hear about. Stereotypes are true. Stereotypes exist because a certain amount of people conform to them. Maybe those people are acting in bad faith. And of course, in South Wales, it was playing rugby, bad beer, choral singing, coal mining, all those sort of things. And some of those things have gone, like coal mining, for example, has gone. And both my grandfathers were coal miners. And you know, you have this social pressure. So the existentialist Camus and Sartre said you had to be free. And if you read Camus' novel, The Outsider, La Tranger, it's about somebody who rejects society's sort of mores. And this, the book begins with his mother dying and he doesn't seem that bothered by it. And you think, oh, you know, that's terrible. Then you think how much of that is imposed from above. And for most of us, you know, that, that's, a, that's a terrible thought, you know, but, but for Mearsalt, the um, central character, it's not a big issue for him. And he it ends up in trouble. He does something which most of us would think was bad and he's condemned to death for it, but he's not really that bothered, you know, because he is free. He has his own, he has his own level of looking at the world as absurd and seeing that you have to choose. And Sartre is an interesting one because of course Sartre is a left-wing intellectual and something that he decided to do. He said, you know, you're condemned to be free. There's always going to be, be these problems where the reality of the world just creeps up on you and it's vile and you, you are overwhelmed by it. So you have to sort of come up with something to commit to. And for him, it was politics. And he said specifically that something he wanted to commit to was the civil rights struggle and the place of, of black people. And obviously in France, there's that colonial history. And if you know about France and Algeria, then, you know, there's a wonderful feature film called Battle of Algiers, which presents both sides of that colonialist debate. So I do urge you to watch Battle of Algiers. It's amazing. In this book, Dana is thrown back in time. Her essence that she's built up 
is thrown into question. She discovers about this familiar link to this boy. So that's essence. So there is inheritance there. So there's that struggle between the social and political situation of her race and her need for individuality. Also what she wants to do in her dealings with the Whelan family in the past. What I found fascinating about this, of course, is that even though there are a lot of people worldwide whose families, whose precedents, whose ancestors were slaves, and that covers all races, particularly we're talking here about black people, obviously, with the slave trade between the UK, America, Africa, the Caribbean. You know, there is this sense and people talk about things like reparations and they talk about the sort of cultural pain of this. But the fact is, is that none of these people, none of us today, um, experience slavery. Our ancestors maybe did. And how tied are we to our ancestors? And it's an interesting thing. I'm somebody who I'm actually not that interested in my family history. Um, you know, it's interesting up to a point, but I don't essentially feel that much of a connection to them. And that's probably because I'm an existentialist. I've seen myself in the world. I'm thrown into it. I've rejected some of the structures and the, the things which I found constricting, which didn't fit my essence or the essence that I wanted to develop. And I was free to choose and I've made choices and they always have been the right ones. But it is that thing. It's about becoming a fully fledged individual and realizing that you're condemned to be free by thrownness. And there is this very interesting thing where what Butler seems to be doing in the book is to remind us of slavery and how inescapable the institution of slavery must feel for many people of colour, both in the UK, the States and other places, you know, who descend from, from slaves. And it's, it does make you think a lot because one of my feelings is that that was a long time ago. Yeah, it was bad. We all need to learn from it. We all need to question it. We all need to look at the true detail of what happened. We shouldn't apportion blame too much. We need to be objective about it. We need to realize that there were black people involved in the slave trade. We need to realize, for example, that if you think the Moors enslaved Spain, the white slave trade thing was, was in North Africa. There's famous cases of Corsairs, pirates raiding right along the Mediterranean coast, taking Europeans into the North African slave trade. Also, even as far as Cornwall and Devon, it would happen. There were famous raids there. So it's throughout human culture. But obviously, because the kind of slavery that's depicted in Kindred is closer to us, and it ties into the post-Enlightenment growth of things like the Industrial Revolution, the things I often talk about at the time of the development of SF. So it is a quite interesting and it's very sort of charged area. We have to think about how that's more recent and how it feeds into the current world we live in and who's benefited. Well, the fact is, is that I don't believe in white privilege. I think privilege is to do with money um, and what you receive at birth was passed on at birth. Now, of course, internally being an existentialist, I don't consider that important, but obviously there are a lot of people who are born with money, there's inherited wealth, and maybe some of that comes from bad things in the past. But what you get in this is that Butler is reminding us of the her, her connection, and the connection of people of color like her to the past through slavery, and how possibly that hangs like a shadow over them. And maybe that's because of institutional racism in America. And of course, as we know, for a century after, you know, slavery was taken apart in the southern states, then, you know, there was still segregation till the 60s and a terrible thing. So, so the, you know, the, the birth pains of the new nation, as it were, are still there. So it is quite an important thing. So it does remind you of that. So do read it. It's a great read. And even though I don't really think she's a wonderful stylist. It, it is the one book by her I would really recommend. On the back it says, a brilliant depiction of the reality of slavery. It also examines how the past reaches into and changes the present. So maybe that's the thing. So SF that engages with history to me is really important because you can read Bring the Jubilee by Ward Moore. You could read Guns of the South by Harry Turtledove, which are alternate history things, but really they have time machines. So that's a bit of a cheat to me. But it is important to see SF in this historical context. If it to be used, history is quite interesting. So even though I'm not a massive apologist for hanging on to the past and for moving forward and for saying that people are not enslaved anymore, um, maybe there should be reparations for countries. Maybe there shouldn't because 
nobody alive today is responsible for the evils of their predecessors their ancestors i'm not responsible you're not responsible maybe some people have benefited and you know i draw it back to you know there's all sorts of cultural analogs if i draw it back to where i come from my grandfathers as say were minors they died in their early 60s i think my, my one grandfather was 70 the other was 64 he didn't even retire and it's because of diseases related to coal mining and that happened to an enormous number of people and it was coal mining that powered the industrial revolution now the coal miners didn't get rich a handful of capitalists got rich and yes they were white but if you want to talk about white privilege it's just a handful of capitalists so we should be really talking about maybe the way that capitalism has exploited people and there's good and bad in all types and creeds of people so looking at this through the lens of existentialism is really interesting and what you see is this this maybe inability in Butler and maybe in people who really relate to this book to see themselves as individuals and to not inherit too much essence but regard themselves as being thrown into the world and to be free to choose now maybe that's a lot more difficult to say if you're in a minority and I'm sure in lots of cases it is and have coming from a minority myself I'm Welsh there are only three million of us in the UK there are actually more Muslims in the UK than there are Welsh people so there you go so you know I could say I'm a minority in my own country I live in England I, I'm surrounded by English people I love England I love the English and it's a great great country so it is that whole thing now obviously I'm not of colour so it's a different different thing but there is something to be said for maybe leaving the past behind it sometimes. Sometimes, But to look at SF through the context of history is really important. And I really enjoyed revisiting this, so give it a try. Bye for now.